Welcome to Voice of the Vatican. Our top stories. Jubilee for the marginalized. As the great Jubilee year draws to a close, a special Jubilee pilgrimage is held in Rome for the homeless and those who have lived on the streets. Springtime of Faith, an international summit in Rome, brings together ecumenical leaders who are building apostolates to encourage a blossoming of faith. Comfort after tragedy. Cardinal Bagnasco visits three towns in central Italy hit hard by recent earthquakes. 125 years of faith. Cardinal Filoni visits Africa to celebrate the anniversary of the birth of the church in Zambia. We'll speak to Father Brian Boalia about the vibrance of the church in Zambia. Standing for Life. The pro-family group, the Standing Sentinels, stage a peaceful protest against the encroaching restrictions to the right of free speech to stand up for the rights of the family. Three parent children. The church weighs in on a medical technology that uses the DNA of three adults in the process of fertilization of an embryo. Holy doors. The special Jubilee doors which were opened in churches throughout the world are closing as the Holy Year draws to an end. I'm Ashley Nerona in Rome, Italy, and you're watching Voice of the Vatican, only on Shalom World TV. It's one of the last events of the Extraordinary Jubilee of Mercy. And from November 11th to 13th, Rome hosts the Jubilee for those who live on the street or have experienced homelessness. 6,000 people from all over Europe have come to participate, to partake in prayer, reconciliation services, and adoration. The participants were received by Pope Francis for a catechesis on November 11th. On the 12th, the Vatican hosted a charity concert called With the Poor and For the Poor. The Roman Symphonic Orchestra and the National Choir of St. Cecilia performed excerpts from pieces by Academy Award-winning composer Ennio Morricone, who conducted while the choir of the Diocese of Rome was led in the performance of sacred songs by Monsignor Marco Frezina. The homeless were the guests of honor at the event. Afterward, volunteers distributed a meal and a small gift to the guests. The money raised from a free will offering will go to benefit the Pope's charitable causes. The event culminates with the Holy Father celebrating Mass for the participants on the 13th. The Springtime of Faith Foundation hosted its 11th annual ecumenical summit in Rome to cultivate signs of Pope John Paul II's springtime of evangelization and to work toward the unity that Christ prayed for in John 17, 21, that they may be one. Voice of the Vatican spoke to the founder of the Springtime of Faith Foundation, Thomas Wykes Jr., for more. We've uh, gathered here in Rome, bringing together those of many different faith traditions to talk about how we can respond more generously to the Lord's call that they all may be one. And uh, out of this function has arisen a number of great decisions that leaders have made, both personally in regards to how they serve Jesus. And also collaboratively, we've had a number of initiatives that have emerged. Uh, I'm particularly heartened by discussions that took place after one of these events uh, between Southern Baptist leaders and, and Catholic leaders. And that resulted in more discussions in Nashville uh, after this event. And um, that led to, to my understanding, in no small part to this function, a renewed dialogue that had been stalled uh, for about 10 years. And uh, recently there was a joint statement by Southern Baptists and Catholics on religious freedom. And so uh, out of the small event in Rome uh, where people with great joy have gathered, uh, some, some wonderful little buds and flowers have, uh, have bloomed in different parts of the world. Cardinal Francis Arinze, the Prefect Emeritus of the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments, addressed the gathering for the 11th consecutive year, speaking about signs of hope blossoming in apostolates that share the love, truth, and light of Christ. While there are many things to lament in the world of today, there are also 
reasons for giving thanks to God that Christians are making more effort to meet one another, to listen to one another, to ask ourselves, what can we do to make the world a better place in which to live? What can we do so that we be more authentic Christian? Reading the Gospels and the rest of the Bible, especially the New Testament, is very important. And reading them, hopefully, together, and asking ourselves what those who came earlier in Christianity, how they understood it, those we call the fathers of the church, the days of St. Augustine, St. Ambrose, St. Ephraim, St. John Chrysostom, because we are not the first Christians. Christianity has been around for 2,000 years, and, but we are striving and we are called to live it today. Angelo Benyasco, the Archbishop of Genova and President of the Italian Bishops' Conference, visited Spoleto, Norcia, and San Pellegrino, areas hit hard by the recent earthquakes that devastated parts of central Italy. He entered into the red zone to view the destruction up close, and later had lunch with residents who've been displaced. The October 30th 6.6 .6 quake was the strongest to strike Italy in 36 years and fortunately caused no deaths. Although the first quake on August 24th killed nearly 300, since then more than 20,000 aftershocks have shaken the area, which lies between the regions of Umbria, Lazio, Marche, and Abruzzo. 15,000 people have been displaced, some still sleeping in tents. One of the towns affected is Norcia, the hometown of St. Benedict, who was the founder of monasticism in the West. In the recent earthquake, a 14th century church dedicated to the saint was razed to the ground. The fire brigade used cranes to lift and rescue precious sacred art from inside this and various damaged churches throughout the region. The monastery of St. Benedict had been built above the 5th century ruins of the house of St. Benedict and his twin sister, St. Scholastica, and has been the location of monastic communities since the 10th century. We pray for the people of central Italy, the monks of Norcia, and all those who've been affected by the devastating earthquakes. Prefect of the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples, Cardinal Fernando Filone has visited Malawi and Zambia, Africa, on the behalf of Pope Francis. In Malawi, he presided at the consecration of St. Joseph the Worker Catholic Cathedral in the Karanga Diocese. He thanked the lay community for their work spreading the gospel, saying, without a doubt, you are indispensable for this work of evangelization. He then proceeded to Zambia, where he addressed the Zambian Catholic bishops gathered in the capital Lusaka for their November plenary meeting. He also participated in the celebrations marking 125 years since the birth of the Catholic Church in Zambia. For more on the life of the Church in that country and her 125 years of faith, Voice of the Vatican spoke to Father Brian Bualia and the Diocese of Mepica. The first time the missionaries you know, of Africa, the famous, you know, the White, the White Fathers, you know, they came to Zambia in 1891. Of course, you know, it's a beautiful coincidence that this year when we are actually celebrating the extraordinary jubilee of mercy, at the same time we are celebrating this great experience of 125 years. One of the, the things that the diocese is doing, you know, like one that really excites me, you know, you know putting this year of mercy in practice, is that the diocese has decided to, you know, to, to do a collection, this is a special collection, and the destination of the funds that will be realized from this, this you know, venture will go towards helping the two big prisons that we have in our, in, our, in, our, in our dances. Communication can be a challenge in the country, since Zambia has more than 72 languages and dialects. That means when a document is sent from the Vatican, it has to be translated into local dialects before it can be shared with the faithful. 85% of the population of Zambia is Christian. 20% of those are Catholics. There's a kind of generosity, you know, in our people. Yeah. The vibrance, you know. I don't know if because our faith is too young, but the vibrance is just amazing, especially when we are celebrating the liturgy. I think it's just awesome. We come to Zambia, we not want to go back, you know, it's just, it's just amazing. I think that the Church of Africa, you know, it's, 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 it's the, it's the 
it gives hope to the church of today, the whole Catholic church. It's the church of the future. It's the church that gives hope to the whole mother church. You know? That's why I'm reminded of the beautiful words of, you know, that Messiah, you know, in, in his book, God or nothing, you know, he, he, he makes that prophetic statement, you know. It's like, you know, I was trying to make a point that the church of Africa is really the hope. It's the church that will serve Christ, that will serve Christianity. Again, it is, I think, Africa that will again sustain, you know, because there's a lot of hope. The future of the churches in Africa. In Rome, the Standing Sentinels, a pro-family movement, organized a demonstration so peaceful that they didn't even move. Standing in the middle of a popular piazza in Rome, the participants stood silently, absorbed in books. The Sentinels' refusal to speak is meant to be a warning of the encroaching threats to freedom of speech and diversity of thinking. 100 different cities across Italy saw organized protests. The Sentinels movement began with the massive demonstrations organized in Paris in 2013 to protest against the law that would legalize gay marriage and adoption. The inspiration for their work is Pope St. John Paul II, and they abide by the following creed. We will stand up every time that human life is threatened when the sacredness of life before birth is attacked, we will stand up and proclaim that no one ever has the authority to destroy unborn life. When a child is described as a burden or looked upon only as means to satisfy an emotional need, we will stand up and insist that every child is a unique and unrepeatable gift of God with the right to a loving and united family. When the institution of marriage is abandoned to human selfishness or reduced to a temporary conditional arrangement that can be easily terminated, we will stand up and affirm the indissolubility of the marriage bond. When the value of the family is threatened because of social and economic pressures, we will stand up and affirm that the family is necessary, not only for the private good, of every person, but also for the common good of every society, nation, and state. When freedom is used to dominate the weak, to squander natural resources and energy, and to deny basic necessities to people, we will stand up and reaffirm the demands of justice and social love. When the sick, the aged, or the dying are abandoned in loneliness, we will stand up and proclaim that they are worthy of love, care, and respect. The first baby born using a medical technique that incorporates DNA from three people is now six months old. The controversial technique has raised a lot of discussion, especially on ethical grounds. To see how the church weighs in, Voice of the Vatican spoke to Father Kim D'Souza of the Archdiocese of Toronto. Uh, it's a technology that allows scientists to take the egg of one woman who might have for some reason trouble problems with her mitochondrial DNA and remove that and then use the DNA of another donor, another woman, uh, with that egg and then fertilize this egg and then implant it, uh, the embryo, implant the, the newly conceived embryo in the womb of the woman who, uh, who originally donated the egg. Uh, and so what it does is that it combines the, the DNA of three, three parents, three donors. Often parents will resort to this uh, because they desire to have a child. And that's a very beautiful and a very holy, holy desire. But uh, in our scientific age, we have the tendency to feel that whatever technology allows, we should do. But of course, that's not true, as we can see from the many things the technology does in terms of the production of weapons, in terms of the damage it does to the environment. So obviously we can see that's not true, and it's especially not true when it applies to such an intimate aspect uh, of parents' parents' life and parents' parents' love. The church sees the married couple that loves and that begets life as an image, as an image of, of God, as an image of the, the life of the inner communion of God, of uh, whose Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so children born into this union uh, spring from the love of their parents. They're not meant to be made, to be objects of production. Uh, the child, every child, is loved by God and uh, and has an incomparable dignity, but the child, by being made an object of production, uh, loses some of that dignity with respect to its parents. The child, you know, parents don't 
make children in the lab. They receive children out of, out of God's love. They're not meant to uh, make them objects of production. And so this technology, as with many others, many other artificial reproductive technologies, in vitro fertilization and so on, uh, which this involves, uh, robs the child of that dignity of being born out of the love of his or her parents and ultimately in this way uh, reflecting the love of God from which each one of us comes. Coming up next, we'll go up close with Father Francis Hoffman, a priest of Opus Dei and executive director of Relevant Radio, about the role of Catholic media in today's busy world. We'll celebrate the feast of the dedication of the church St. John Lateran in Rome, the mother of all churches. We'll celebrate faith with part two of Father David Meadows' Thanksgiving pilgrimage to Italy, to the home of St. Maria Goretti. And we'll take a look back on the 27th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall and examine the church's role in its collapse. Did you like the program you just watched? Help Shalom World bring more programs like this to a global audience. Your support helps us share the peace of Christ with the world. Visit shalomworld.org forward slash donate. And first, more headline news. On November 13th, churches around the world will close their holy doors. The holy doors of the major basilicas of Rome will also close. The doors have been opened since December 8th in celebration of this extraordinary Jubilee year. One of the special traditions of the Jubilee year is that pilgrims walk through the holy doors. And in the words of Pope Francis, the holy door will become a door of mercy through which anyone who enters will experience the love of God who consoles, pardons, and instills hope. In keeping with the typical conditions of receiving the sacraments of confession and communion, reciting the creed, praying for the intentions of the Holy Father, and being detached from sin, one can receive a plenary indulgence after passing through the door. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1471, says, An indulgence is a remission before God of the temporal punishment due to sins, whose guilt has already been forgiven. The concept of the holy door comes from the book of John, chapter 10, verse 9, when Christ says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Relevant Radio is reaching out to souls around the world. It's the largest owned and operated Catholic talk radio network in the United States, with 22 stations and 45 affiliates reaching 29 states. Now, I'll go up close with Relevant Radio Executive Director, Father Francis Hoffman, who is a priest of Opus Dei and better known to many as Father Rocky, to discuss Relevant Radio's role in the world of Catholic media and worldwide evangelization. God has blessed us uh, tremendously. We've grown by 300% in the last three years, from reaching 20 million people to now reaching 65 million people in the United States on AM and FM stations. We reach... Uh, on, on average, monthly through social media, tens of millions of people around the world. That sounds like a big number, but there's seven billion people in the world. So there's and our more Lord's to message is to go out to the whole world. So I don't think we'll ever be satisfied. We want to continue to grow because if you're not growing, you're dying. And God wants us to grow, to reach more people. We've got a great opportunity now that we just announced publicly last week of an upcoming uh, union with um, Immaculate Heart Radio on the West Coast. And uh, working together, now we will be able to double our size and reach 133 million souls. We want to continue that kind of growth and figure out a way that we can reach on our AM and FM radio stations, everybody in the United States of America, with compelling programs so that we have the equivalent of three million Catholics listening five hours a week. And they'll hear with a certain frequency very important messages about family life, a priority of your relationship with your spouse, about spending time with your children, about forgiveness, about mm. humility, about the virtue of chastity and the possibility with God's grace through the Holy Eucharist and through confession, right? And personal testimonials. But uh, we have to understand that the world we live in is vastly different from 100 years ago. 100 years ago, there was one mass media portal uh, probably anywhere in the world. It was the newspaper. Mm. And in big cities, it came out twice a day. 
the morning edition, the afternoon edition. If you read the newspaper, may you be exposed to other people's ideas about an hour a day. Mm -hmm. Today, you're exposed to other people's ideas eight and a half hour days. Wow. Eight and a half hours a day. So that's the internet, that's television, that's radio, it's all the devices out there. So the church today, wherever we are in the world, needs to be in the mass media in a big way. I think the most neat, unique thing we do is the most Catholic thing we do, and that is we, provide, we pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet live every day at 3 p.m. Central Time, and our audience triples at that time. And people listening all over the country can call into a number, talk to a real person, and share their prayer concern at that moment, not only with the host of the show, but everybody else who's listening at that time. That could be 40 or 50 or 100,000 people listening at that very precise moment. And they will multiply their prayers and pray for the people. Right. And it's, it's a simple idea, but it works very, very well because um, we're telling the human story at Relevant Radio. Mm -hmm. And it's a story about love and life and death and sadness and happiness and joy, all the rich complexity of, of human life. And nobody tells the human story better than Jesus Christ, who is the perfect human being, the founder of the Catholic Church. So we have a message that can go out to the whole world. On November 9th, the Church celebrates the Feast of the Dedication of the Lateran Basilica in Rome, called Mater Caput, or Mother and Head of all of the churches of the city and the world. In fact, this was the first official basilica, and built by Constantine in thanksgiving to Christ for his victory over the Milvian Bridge. It was dedicated to Christ the Savior, and later to John the Baptist and John the Evangelist, and built on the property that originally belonged to the noble Lateran family, who had their property confiscated by Emperor Nero when they converted to Christianity. Adjacent to the basilica was the papal residence, where the popes resided until the 14th century. The Lateran Basilica was the site of five ecumenical councils and the signing of the Lateran Treaty in 1929, which gave the Vatican its autonomy, establishing the sovereign Vatican City state. The chair, or cathedra, in this basilica is the seat of the Bishop of Rome, currently Pope Francis. On this solemnity, the readings in the liturgy from 1 Corinthians 3 and 1 Peter 2 recall an essential truth that the church is made up of Christians who are the living stones, built into an edifice on the foundation of Jesus Christ, who is the cornerstone. In the first part of our series, Touched by a Saint on Voice of the Vatican, Father David Meadow shared stories of miracles, the spiritual and physical miracles which followed a visit of the relics of St. Maria Goretti to his parish of St. Mary Immaculate in Plainfield, Illinois. In Thanksgiving, a year later, Father Meadow and his family made a trip to Nettuno, Italy, the hometown of the saint. I owe this young girl a lot, and she has a friendship that she's offered to me and to our parish family, and I consider her a friend. And I wanted to repay that friendship by making this journey and spending time in her home. St. Maria Goretti was only 11 years old when she was killed in 1902. A neighbor, Alessandro Serenelli, tried to rape her, and she refused at the cost of her life. Though she was stabbed 14 times, she died forgiving him, saying she wanted him one day in heaven with her. While in prison, Serenelli converted after Maria appeared to him in a dream, offering him lilies, which then burnt in his hands. Alessandro begged forgiveness from Maria's mother, after which they received communion together at Mass the next day. He eventually became a lay Capuchin brother and was even present at St. Maria's canonization on June 24, 1950. We went to these very holy sites, the place where she died in the hospital the day after she was stabbed 14 times, where she had been operated on. First of all, it's 10 kilometers from her home where she was stabbed and riding on rough roads in a cart Right at the turn of the last century, 1910, um, she had no anesthetic. Um, she had no really helpful medical intervention. And they knew that she was going to die just from the infections that were quickly setting in. And she endured a lot of suffering. And to see the place where that suffering took place and yet where the light of heaven's mercy shone into this world through her heart and the words that she spoke for giving uh, Alessandro Serenelli for killing her. Um, that was a moment I'll never forget. 
um, as somebody who has the joy of announcing God's mercy to others, um, to be in a place where mercy was announced in one of the most profound ways in the story of our faith was for me an inspiration that I will never forget. The young St. Maria Goretti is truly an exemplar of mercy during this Jubilee year. November 9th marked the 27th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev once said that the collapse of the Iron Curtain would have been impossible without Pope John Paul II. Pope St. John Paul II's moral authority laid an important framework for the breakdown of the Iron Curtain and reunification of the East and West. Through speeches and his influence, he played a vital background role in promoting the ideals of unity, compassion, charity, and peace, which eventually prevailed. We remember the words of Pope John Paul II, quote, Warsaw, Moscow, Budapest, Berlin, Prague, Sofia, and Bucharest have become stages in a long pilgrimage toward liberty. It is admirable that in these events, entire peoples spoke out. Women, young people, men, overcoming fears, their irrepressible thirst for liberty sped up developments, made walls tumble down, and opened gates. All week, you can keep up with the latest happenings here in Rome and our Twitter feed, which is at Voice of Vatican. And be sure to like us on Facebook on our Voice of the Vatican page. Keep checking our social media feeds for breaking news and information about upcoming guests and features. And we want to hear your voice too. Email your questions to us at vov at shalomworld.org. I'm Ashley Narona, and on behalf of the entire staff and crew of Voice of the Vatican, I wish you a blessed week. May God bless you and your family. Saying ciao for now from the Eternal City, I will see you right here next week for Voice of the Vatican only on Shalom World TV, where we bring Rome to your home.